Welcome, everybody. I'd like to welcome you today to our panel discussion on Washington printmakers that's being held in conjunction with the exhibition upstairs called Multiplicity. I hope you've had a chance to see it. And if you haven't had a chance already, it will be open after the panel discussion when we have uh, a reception with refreshments upstairs in our courtyard. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to get some housekeeping details out of the way. I'd like to ask you to turn off your cell phone and other noise-making devices. Don't even turn them to vibrate because that interferes with our audiovisual system. <laughs> and uh, we are webcasting this presentation, so if at the end you want to ask a question, please go to one of the two microphones at the side, and that way we'll be able to get your question um, recorded. Um, please join us for a reception upstairs in the courtyard after tonight's program. The exhibition gallery will also be open if you'd like to see the show. And the Public Programs Department is conducting a full evaluation um, this fall of all of our programs. And as you leave the auditorium, you may be asked to fill out a brief survey. And as a thank you for your time and your effort and sharing your comments, you'll be given a voucher for a free cup of coffee from our Courtyard Cafe. So keep that in mind. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to start out by telling you a little bit about the exhibition that engendered this panel discussion. Um, I started out by um, selecting contemporary works of art from our permanent collection. I particularly wanted to feature works that hadn't been shown before in the museum. And I think <clears throat> that only three of the works in the exhibition had ever been shown in this museum before. They're, fairly recent acquisitions for the most part. And so that was one of the criteria that I used to select the show. Of course, I also <clears throat> wanted to show some of our best works. Um, I couldn't show all of our best works. Uh, our space, as large as it is, was not infinite. Um, and uh, you know, the size of the walls also determined which works I could and couldn't show. And, um, but I think the selection worked out fine. But I didn't have any real idea in mind when I was selecting them other than getting some of our best works up. Um, <clears throat> I think that in addition to showing our collection, it does give a fairly good overview of the last three decades of contemporary American art, not just prints, but American art, because most of these artists are not strictly printmakers. <laughs> Um, as I look out over the audience, I see a number of our donors, and I'd like to thank you once again for helping make this exhibition possible. Uh, without you, it wouldn't be half as good as it is. So I would like to thank our donors. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> now, as far as the title, Multiplicity, that's a real accomplishment for me. My whole life, I've wanted to do a show that has a one-word title, and I finally did it. Uh, and you know, usually we get stuck with a colon and then an explanation, and it's a real mouthful to say. But multiplicity says it all. Um, the meaning of the term. First of all, there are a variety of artists, and there's a variety of styles represented in this exhibition. And as I looked at this checklist that I had chosen, I realized that many of the works were multi-part works. There were series, such as those by Carol Walker and Tim Rollins and Coase. There were sequences, such as those by Bryce Martin and Sal Lewitt. There were closely related works, such as the two woodcuts by John Buck and the two mezzotints by Susan Rothenberg, or the two lithographs by Ed Ruscha. There was repetition, as in the prints, by Lynn Myers and Andrea Way. And there were multi-part works, such as those by Kiki Smith and John Baldessari. And there are others in each of these categories. And so the idea of multiplicity seemed to work very well, because we're dealing with these multi-part works in this exhibition. Now, not all of them are multi-part works, but all of them are edition prints. And so by that very definition, they are multiple originals. And um, even the un single unique work 
in the exhibition. There's a monotype woodcut by Jim Dine, has the woodblock figure of Venus de Milo re repeated. It's an edition of 20. And so the woodblock part of it is repeated, it's multiple, and the coloring or the monotype and the painting are unique to each one. Um, the large self-portrait by Chuck Close that you see at the entrance was printed with more than 100 screens. Uh, another multiplicity aspect. And the image itself is broken up into multiple squares. You get the idea, the title works. Uh, now, I would like to uh, keep my remarks short so that we can proceed with the artist's presentations and panel discussion. Each of the artists will make a brief presentation about his or her work, and then I will pose a few questions for them to discuss, and they'll come up here, we'll all be sitting up here. Finally, we will open the discussion to questions from the audience. We'll then move up to the courtyard for our reception and refreshments, and you'll have a, talk, a chance to talk to the artists individually. Now, all of the artists on tonight's panel live and work in the Washington area. We have represented three different generations of artists. One of the artists is also a professional printer, and th the other three work collaboratively with professional printers in the Washington area, namely at the Pyramid Atlantic Workshop in Silver Spring, the Hand Print Workshop International in Alexandria, and with independent printer Skip Barnhart in Washington, D.C. Lou Stovall was born in Athens, Georgia in 1937 and grew up in Springfield, Massachusetts. He studied at the Rhode Island School of Design and at Howard University. Since 1962, he has lived and worked in Washington, D.C. He is a professional printer as well as an artist who makes his own prints, and he's the only artist in this exhibition who printed his own work. Lynn Myers is currently a Washington, D.C.-based artist. She holds a BFA from the Cooper Union in New York City and an MFA from the California College of the Arts in San Francisco, California. Her work has been exhibited widely in both the United States and abroad, with solo exhibitions at Margaret Thatcher Projects in New York, G Fine Art in Washington, D.C., the Phillips Collection in Washington, D.C., and the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles, a show that, that closed just recently, I think. <clears throat> Michael Platt is a 2007 recipient of the prestigious France and Virginia Bader Fund grant. Platt has exhibited internationally and nationally his latest one-person shows were In Transit, International Visions at the Gallery, Washington, D.C. in 2007, and Just Above Water at the University of Maryland. Numerous private collections <clears throat> have his art in their permanent holdings, as do the Smithsonian American Art Museum, the Corcoran Museum, the Library of Congress, the Schomburg Research Center in Black Culture in the New York Public Library, the Yale University Art Gallery, et cetera, et cetera. Andrea Way was born in San Francisco in 1949 and is now an artist in Washington, D.C., although she does spend quite a bit of her time in San Francisco as well. She got her B.A. at Indiana University and exhibits largely in Washington, D.C., New York, and San Francisco. Her works are in the permanent collections of the Smithsonian American Art Museum, the Phillips Collection, the San Francisco Legion of Honor, the Cleveland Museum of Art and the Corcoran Gallery of Art and the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden. Huh. Now, I would like to ask each of the speakers to come up here, do your little presentation, and in whatever order you would like, if you'd like to go in the order in which I introduced you, that would be fine. If not, do what you like. Uh, so I'd like to welcome our first speaker. Lou, are you going to go first? No? All right. Well, don't be bashful. So our first speaker is Lou Stovall. I'd like to say that I'm not really prepared for this, uh, but that wouldn't be totally true. Um, 
speaking to uh, a body of people who love printmaking as much as I do, uh, you know, it's a wonderful thing. And it's nice that you all came out to uh, visit us and honor us and so on. Uh, it's wonderful to have a show here. It's uh, terrific that uh, Joanne Mosier put this show together. Uh, it's hard to say much more about that, so I'm going to talk about the art. The, um, could we have some art up there? <laughs> <laughs> the uh, print that I'm represented uh, by in this show uh, is called Land Origin. And it's an idea about joy, especially the joy of printmaking, but also the joy of freedom uh, when working. And it's also about discovery. So having ideas and then discovering those ideas and then how to work with those ideas in order to, that they should uh, express something makes a big difference. So the, I'd probably be better off if you all asked me questions later. Uh, but the, uh, when you see the print, you'll see that it represents you know, a kind of landscape. Uh, it has a border, so it becomes an image within an image. Uh, it has a semblance of some water in the middle and two mountain sides with grasses in front and sky behind. And quintessentially, that is my idea of an ideal landscape. Um, I wanted to leave it to the viewer to imagine what goes behind that facade of color. Uh, so it isn't like deep perspective. Uh, as I've done you know, in some of my earlier work. Uh, this is really upfront work, and it's, uh, it has to do with the passage of color of uh, moving before your eye and giving you an opportunity to imagine that there are places and things beyond what's there, just as I imagined it when I was doing it. Uh, the whole idea of my making art is the discovery of the dynamics of color and the joy in working with color. So, thank you. This is my preparation. It's on the back of a receipt. Um, so um, I was going to talk about um, Joanne's idea of multiplicity very quickly. Um, there's so many different ways of interpreting that with um, the process of printmaking and with the work that I do in general. Um, so one thing, where am I going with this? How do I, do I just get, okay. This is the print that's in the exhibition here. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about as far as multiplicity and printmaking is concerned uh, is the idea that um, for me, I work in my studio alone most of the time, and, or all of the time, and when I'm making prints, I'm generally collaborating with a uh, master printer. So in that regard, um, there are multiple parties making the prints, and um, what happens in the printmaking studio would be entirely different if I were making the prints on my own. So um, I really consider the master printers that I work with to be a big part of my process. Um, this piece is, um, was printed by Skip Barnhart here in Washington. I think he's here. Skip, are you here? I don't know. Um, and um, this piece was printed at the Tamarin Institute, um, uh, which is a, um, a lithography studio um, in um, Albuquerque, New Mexico. This is a piece that was commissioned by uh, the Phillips Collection for their 90th anniversary this year. Um, and um, it is uh, a combination of two images that are printed together on one sheet of paper. So uh, another way of looking at the idea of multiplicity. Um, and this was also printed at the Tamarin Institute five or six years ago. 
Um, and it was published by them as well. Um, I worked with a master printer named Bill Legatuda, who's amazing. And um, this piece demonstrates the idea of multiplicity in another respect. Um, it's actually each side is the same image. So if you can picture printing the same image twice and then flipping one of them over and having them meet in the middle. So another way of using the printmaking process to demonstrate um, an idea of multiplicity. Um, one of the things that happens when I make prints is that I take these ideas that come about through the process of printmaking and they come back into my studio with me and end up uh, influencing the drawings that I make. This is a piece that was printed uh, by Skip Barnhart here in Washington, D.C. and published by Robert Brown. Uh, and it's um, an etching. And we printed it twice. Um, so there are actually two editions, one in um, this red ink and the other in the black ink. Um, so um, another way of thinking about multiplicity in the printmaking process and um, in the process of editioning a print. And this is a piece that was published by um, the San Jose Institute of Contemporary Art in California. Um, I did a printmaking residency there. And uh, it's a suite of three prints. Each of them shares one plate in common. So if you can picture that there are uh, two images printed uh, together in each one of these prints, but there's one of those images that's in common to all three of them. So it's, it's a little bit hard to see unless you have time to really um, sit with the three images, but it is, um, you can. You can see it once you allow your eyes to adjust, but we don't have time for that. And um, lastly, this is the um, project that Joanne mentioned that um, is a site-specific work at the Hammer Museum that uh, just ended a couple weeks ago. Um, and it's, um, so, so I, I, I'm, I make drawings in the studio, um, I make prints, and I do site-specific work, so this is an example of um, some, one of the site-specific pieces that I've made recently. Well, my adventure in printmaking took a serious turn when I started to attend the Southern Graphics Council Printmaking Conference. The thing I really liked about that when, was the product fair. At the product fair, they had all these new ways, new, new ways, approaches, and techniques and materials to doing printing. A lot of that stuff was um, involved the computer, digital printmaking. Um, in the beginning, my idea was to mix the two processes together, traditional printmaking, traditional litho, traditional etching with the digital image. And that's what I did. Um, I like the digital image because you can also make the image larger than what it is. Uh, most of these images that you'll see are 36 by, by 60 or three by five feet. But after uh, struggling with the, trying to make the digital image Look like a print. I say, why don't you just let the print be the print? Just let the print speak for itself. And that kind of freed me up to the point where I can really move a lot fast in terms of working on the, what I was doing as opposed to how I was trying to do it. And some of the things I worked on was Katrina. Uh, this is uh, standing in the water with a lock on my brain. This is below the water line. If anybody in New Orleans tried to sell you a house with a basement, don't buy it. <laughs> I dealt with abandoned spaces. I, I really fell in love with the um, Eastern Penitentiary uh, in Philadelphia. It's big, huge 
ugly looking building, but uh, uh, it was a ruin. But in each cell, you can still see life was there. I dealt with being free. This is uh, the, the Snow Desert Dancers. Uh, lately, I've been dealing with the, uh, the Middle Passage. Uh, I didn't use that boat that most people see, the, people, the slaves packed like sardines. I started to use this little John boat. But it wasn't about the passage that, uh, over here. It was about the, the passage getting away from where you was caught. So you went through the swamps. And usually the image uh, on the boat, they made it. And there's another image, the same person underwater. They didn't make it. Some make it, some didn't. I dealt with that boat, I dealt with the hole, the cargo hole, the basement. I started to work with, uh, taking a lot of pictures uh, with black backgrounds, and that changed everything. Uh, this is uh, unknown cargo. And I, I began to repeat images, and that brought up the idea of ritual and dancing a little bit more. This is the Red River Dance. And this is um, where I'm at right now. This is a, a circle of grace. I'm having a lot of fun painting these good looking young ladies. <laughs> yeah, so I advanced this with uh, okay, great. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm starting with the cicada print that's in the exhibition. And um, I wanted to talk about this a little bit because there's a great story on, on how it was made. Um, well, beginning with Dennis O'Neill, whom I've known for over 30 years, uh, who has a fantastic creative way of making prints. And when I first started making prints, I wanted to bring to the process something that I couldn't do in a regular drawing or painting. And so there was a huge infestation of cicadas in 1987, the 17-year cycle, and I collected the wings. Um, one day they were chirping, the next day the, their bodies were everywhere, and then just their wings were everywhere, and they gathered in, in you know, bunches in the grass, and, um, and they were so beautiful. And so the birds, I guess, ate the bodies but weren't interested in eating the wings. So I collected hundreds of them, and I saved them. And um, I'm, I'm kind of an amateur naturalist, um, and that's what informs a lot of the work that I do. And so anyway, when I started making prints, I thought, what if I could use these actual cicada wings in the process of making, making a print? And the idea was that they would be, without talking too much about process, but to lay them on the light table and then project them onto the screen. Um, it, it, it just was a, a great process. And so the making of the print was something that um, was an incredibly inventive and joyful process. And working with Denny's uh, shop with George Fox, who was the... Uh, the master printer, you know, pulling the squeegee. Um, it, it, it just, it, there's 22 layers in this print. And, um, and so there was a building process that is like what I do in my regular drawings and paintings. But in this case, it was on 50 sheets of paper. And by the time we finished, there was an addition of 36 plus a few artist proofs. So anyway, that's my, I, that was actually, I think, the second print that I made. Um, this was the first print, and uh, it's called Shark. And uh, I collected all these shark's teeth on the um, western shore of the Chesapeake Bay. And so I, I nestled them into, a, um, in, into something I could photograph. And so there's a, a, a four-part color separation photograph buried beneath all of the drawing. But that was the first print, and it was a real struggle. I mean, at one point, I just wanted to rip it up and throw it away. It wasn't working. And then all of a sudden, you know, this one I did work on with Denny. 
and we finally were able to wrest something beautiful out of it and uh, it became a really really nice print but it the it was my first experience working on silk screen and um, it was a real tough go but sometimes the hardest ones uh, turn out the best uh, this is another print that I made with Denny called Go, another silkscreen print. Now this uh, is, is also a print, but it is a dry point etching. And this uh, was made with Magnolia Editions out in Oakland. And the first day I met Don Farnsworth, who is the, um, the head of the show at Magnolia Editions, um, I, he didn't know my work. I just came over to meet him and talk about doing a tapestry. And anyway, he had this etching, um, a dry point of his cutting table where they had cut paper for 20 years. And uh, somebody had the idea of inking it up and running it through the etching press. And I said, wow, what is that? That is just really beautiful. And he said, um, well, we're, we have about 10 artists who are going to be doing, you know, individual works on top of this, you know, dry point. And I said, well, I have to be part of this. And he looked at me like I was crazy because he didn't know me. And then I showed him my work and he rolled it up and he handed it to me. Um, but anyway, all I did was I put a white dot in every cell created by the cut marks. And um, the piece is called Pasigalia which also relates to multiplicity. Um, and it's a musical term of, you know, the variation on, a, on the same theme. So, and that, that piece is actually about four by eight feet. It's a pretty, pretty large piece. Um, I'm just going to show you some other. These are drawings now. Um, just for those of you who aren't familiar with my work. Th this piece is called um, John's Cage referring to Jasper Johns and John Cage. And I, I'm glad I have this one in here. I didn't know I was going to be hanging next to uh, a John Cage piece, um, which was just thrilling to me. Um, but anyway, that was all about uh, chance, the way um, the elements appeared on that. Uh, this piece is called Middleman. And I don't know how well this projects, but um, another drawing. So I'm just showing you some of the drawings that I've done over the years. Um, this piece is called Rogue. And it was called Rogue because um, there was a large black dot down towards the bottom. And I was kind of worried that it was going to throw everything off balance because it, it just seemed too large. And um, anyway, I ended up really liking the fact that there was one rogue dot down there. And that's why I called it that. And this is on a wooden panel. Uh, it's part of my Gravity Pool series. Um, here's another piece. Yeah, I could tell a story about each piece, but I don't have time. So that's it. Julianne, do you want to put this on? Um... Okay, okay. Oh, I have to carry this. Okay, yeah. So take your thing. Well, thank you very much. Um, are we live? <coughs> can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good, good. They can put these on us. <laughs> yeah, I can. Do we have to turn these? Oh. Well, I think you can. <laughs> are we? Yes. OK, good. Everyone's happy, comfortable? Mm -hmm. All right, good. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I think you can see, even from these four artists, the great variety of styles and techniques and everything. I mean, here we are in one relatively limited area, and we have a little bit of everything. So I'd like to start out asking you to talk a little bit about why you make prints. Now, some of you touched on that, and I wonder if you'd like to talk a little bit more about the appeal of printmaking and what you feel you can do with prints that you can't do with your other media that you work in. So I see you shaking your head, so why don't we start there? Um, um, well, I actually uh, thought I was going to be a printmaker when I started art school and then um, 
veered in the direction of painting, but I've always continued to make prints. And I think um, mostly because uh, they do contribute so strongly to the work that I do in the studio. Um, one of the things about the work that I do in the studio is that it's uh, very labor intensive. And um, in the print shop, you can see results more quickly and you can actually take an image that you've made and make changes to it easily, which is definitely a part of the process. Um, and so that it, it's, a, it's a way of learning things about the work that I'm doing and the particular interest that I have at the given time when I'm making a print. Um, that I, I, learn, I take things from the print shop and bring them into the studio in a way that I don't think I could um, do in another medium. So, um, you know, the collaborative part is important to me also, mm -hmm. um, but in a really different way. So, okay, good. Yeah. Michael? Um, I did a lot of drawing, a whole lot of drawing at first. And I fell in love with uh, etching because I couldn't draw those kind of marks. And that's, that's the real reason why I started to do printing. Um, but for me to, I would start with a, no idea in, in mind. I would destroy the plate and then find the image. It it's a long process. Uh, sometimes you don't find the image, but you may find the image later on. And I did all, most of the stuff after I got out of college. It was at a WD printmaking workshop with Percy Martin. I went over there loyally for about 25 years every Saturday. And if you had work to get done, you, you got there around 9 or 10 o'clock, because shenanigans start around 2. Every day. <laughs> at 2 o'clock, shenanigans start. You get your lunch, and you get that rum, and stuff starts. So uh, <laughs> lately, um, my workshop is, is, is home, because I do everything digital. And I have this 44-inch wide printer. Uh, but most of, the, most of the magic happens in the computer, and maybe about three or four o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. and then you hit that champagne. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. and then you go to sleep. But at the house, a lot of a lot of people come by, and I do a lot of printing for other people also. So it's still company, uh, that the atmosphere in the workshop, uh, hanging around a bunch of artists. It's, it's, it seems to happen a lot when you do a lot of printing. Okay, Andrea, do you want to address um, this? Yeah, I think the, uh, the thing about printmaking for me um, is all about the collaborative process. And the reason that um, I've, I think I'm such a good fit with Danny is because he is wildly inventive in terms of the process that he uses as a printmaker. Um, everything from using coffee grounds and, you know, ju just doing all kinds of um, alchemical kinds of things as a printmaker. And my strong suit as an artist is my capacity for invention. And, um, you know, it's just boundless. And so the collaboration that we were able to do um, just sort of compounded, uh, you know, what we both have in common, I think, as artists. And so um, it would never be something I would expect. And, um, of course, when I'm working by myself, the same thing happens. I never know what to expect either. But there's just something about collaborating with somebody that is a very special part of the process for me. And Lou, and I should just reiterate that Lou is the only master printmaker we have here. Because as well as being an artist, he has printed some magnificent prints for many other artists, including Jacob Lawrence and many others, locally and nationally. And so his reputation is really based on his work as a printer and as an artist. So in a way, it's a little redundant to ask you why you make prints, but I still want to ask you what you see so special about it. Well, could we run through my prints again? Uh, yeah. I, forgot <laughs> I forgot to click the thing. Oh, all right. Why don't we? <clears throat> Oh, yeah. That Can we do a, it a little slower? That was a little fast. <laughs> yeah, not quite that. Yeah, okay. Well, I started making prints when I was 15, uh, and I printed for more than probably 80 artists. 
in my life and times, I've taught uh, literally a hundred people to, uh, to make silkscreen prints. And the reason I like silkscreen prints and the reason I continue doing it is because uh, I absolutely love it. I love the fragrance of the ink. I love the whole order of uh, the compelling order that, uh, that is demanded of a printmaker. Uh, I love the challenge of having an artist come and work with me. And lately, I love the challenges that I uh, give to myself to come up with new images that probably wouldn't be done any other way. For instance, these prints that I'm now calling vertical collage, um, I'm actually making a flat print and then I'm cutting it up and putting it back together. And that kind of uh, multiplicity, uh, for Joanne, uh, it's fun and it's, uh, it's something that I hadn't thought of before and I don't believe anyone else has thought of it before. But going back to uh, working with, say, Sam Gilliam, who is uh, probably my favorite artist to work with, uh, because first of all, he's, we're close by, he's just across the park. And uh, so I used to experiment on Sam with his images. <laughs> and then he would, of course, experiment with me as to what he could get out of the print. With Jacob Lawrence, it was pretty much dead-on printing, uh, except when Jacob wanted to do something like water, which, uh, which, which hadn't occurred to him when he was uh, doing his originals uh, in uh, poster, poster color, and uh, uh, I've forgotten his other medium. Um, this is going to be one of those moments. <laughs> uh, he was doing tempera, I'm sorry. Uh, so his work was fairly static, but when he wanted movement, uh, we would do that movement in silkscreen printmaking because it was fluid. And uh, I could send him the proofs because he was often in uh, Seattle, Washington at the time that I was making the prints for him and I was here. So I would make a proof, send it to him, and he would approve it, and so on. With uh, an artist like Gene Davis, he loved the precision of doing those wonderful little narrow stripes that you really could only do with silk screen at that particular time until he discovered that you could tape the canvas <laughs> and, uh, and exact it that way. There's um, an artist who many of you may not have seen his work, Louis Delsart. Uh, I probably had more fun working with Louis Delsart uh, than any other artist. Am I going on too long? No, go ahead. Okay. Uh, because Louis is fairly, he's the opposite end. I'm like an order freak. And, and Louis is like a total inventive freak. Nothing stands still where Louis is concerned, including himself. So when Louis was working with me in the studio, I exacted an area that he couldn't go past. <laughs> <laughs> but I could go past you know, that line and see what he was doing. And what happens with Louis is that whatever he sees, he's inventing and working on top of it. So he says, well, what am I going to do while I'm not talking to you and while I'm being quiet, because I can't be quiet? And I said, well, Louis, here, work on this. So I gave him a print, a proof, that, he had, that I had made for him as we were working. And Louis started drawing the face again, this beautiful <laughs> face. And so the next day, I took that piece and exacted my print to the face that he had done, the most recent. And he says, well, can I have another one? So I said, sure. So I gave him another proof. And by the time we had gone through like six different proofs, I had a really beautiful face. Now, it's difficult to do a face with, with silk screen because it's not a continuous type medium. You have to paint it, and you have to brush it, and you have to figure things out. And the way that I did that was to figure out, well, if you can reduce silkscreen printmaking to lines and dots, you can do almost anything. And if you can thin your ink to like water, water thin, and make a glaze, or print it very, very thick so you can barely get it through the screen, 
then there are no limits. So for me, uh, I'm still that kid at 15 years old discovering silkscreen printmaking and what it can do. So that's why I make prints. Okay, good, good. <laughs> So I think I'll jump right into one of the hot button issues, digital printmaking. You'll notice that there is only one work in the show that was made digitally, and that's Michael's print. And I should confess right up front is that I'm a lot tougher on digital prints than I am on other media. A lot of them that I see seem to be very sort of flat and reproductive, but then there are some that are just magnificent, like Michael's print. And so, um, from the point of view of a curator, I, I'm just very fussy with what I like. But could you talk a little bit, well you did a little bit about why you love digital printmaking and how you discovered it. Is there anything else you want to say about that before I ask the others to make their comments? It's um, the speed. <laughs> the speed? The speed. You can come up with the image faster. You can make your changes quicker faster. Uh, the whole argument about digital prints, I just like to say, get over it. <laughs> just, <laughs> it's just, I'm just making an image, you know, and yeah. uh, it can be printed again. And if you use archival stuff, archival inks, archival paper, it's there. I remember once uh, I had a conversation with uh, Sam Gilliam, he, who hates the computer. Uh, he said a comment about, uh, Somebody in the audience asked a question about the validity of digital work. And but his, his response was, uh, I'm the museum. I mean, the museum comes to me for work. I don't work for the museum. But I just come up with, a, with an image. I mean, if, if this dude can do this image made with elephant doo-doo, I mean, I can do anything I want to do. Yeah, here, here. <laughs> and uh, if, uh, I remember when, um, Rauschenberg was here. Uh, I went to that, uh, his opening that was here. And he had a whole room full of white canvases. I got there real early. And I got real close to it. I said, man, ain't nothing on them. The next room was all black canvases. But when I brought my class over, I said, what do you think? They said, uh, ain't nothing here. I said, well, this tells me I can do anything I want to do in between these two rooms, anything. So as long as I'm happy, I can just, just do it. I don't care. <laughs> Good. Andrea, the print that you have up in the exhibition, Cicada, could have been done a whole lot easier with digital technology. Why did you choose not to use that? Well, for one thing, I made it in 1992. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> no, there were computers. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think the whole tactile thing of making it with the real wings and, and all that sort of thing. Um, but getting back to this whole idea about um, digital as a medium, I'll just tell a very brief story. I ran into Neil Young at a restaurant down at the beach in California one night. We got into this conversation about vinyl versus CDs, you know, versus digital. And if he could, if he ruled the world, everybody would listen to vinyl with the old Fisher tube, you know, stereo. And, but we're in the 21st century now, and there's just no turning back. I mean, we're in the digital age, we're in the interconnected uh, state of, you know, whether you like it or not, it's here. And I think that it's a medium that, that will be celebrated just like any other medium. So I say here, here, Michael. All right, <laughs> somebody, <laughs> help me out. Lynn, do you have any thoughts on this? Oh, I, I, I've never done this kind of work, so I, I, um, I think that good art is good art regardless of um, you know, whether it? you're using new technology. I, for myself, I, um, have um, a deep interest in um, the physical labor of making the work. And um, you can see that in the larger, you know, in the site-specific wall drawings. Um, and so um, there is this tactile thing that I also share, uh, and that is um, part of my interest in working on whether it's a metal plate or a lithography stone. So, um, 
I guess that's where I'm coming from when, mm -hmm. I, when I do that work. And Lou, I know you have strong feelings about this uh, subject, and I wonder if you could explain them a bit. Well, I was afraid you'd ask me again. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll begin by saying uh, I respect all art mediums, and my appreciation of art and its mediums uh, begins, begins with the idea and ends with the lack of idea. So if someone is merely making digital prints from another uh, you know, uh, format, then I lose interest. But if you're using digital printing the way that Michael is doing, I mean, Michael is like a master artist, and he can do, as he said, anything that he wants to do. And what he does is equal to what most other artists are doing, but using his own medium. And I feel that I'm doing you know, pretty much the same thing. I'm not as familiar with Andrea's work and uh, uh, with Lynn. Lynn's work. I just met Lynn for the first time today, so you have to forgive me. Plus that I'm old. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but when you take a medium like digital printing, and when you come to it the way that I did, was to have read an article that a local printmaker wrote saying, this is going to be the end of traditional printmaking. And so the hairs went up on the back of my neck. Uh, and I said, I don't want to talk to anybody who thinks that this is going to be the end of anything that's traditional. Uh, Silkscreen printmaking has been around you know, for hundreds of years, hundreds of years, before the, uh, before the early Chinese work. Um, and all of a sudden, some you know, machine is going to come along and displace us. You know, it's uh, the whole idea of, of, of the jet uh, printing uh, that, from that French phrase, uh, which means spurt, ink spurt, you know. Well, if you want to, you know, spurt, spurt your ink or however you want to do it, that's fine with me, but nothing beats <coughs> the intelligence of one person before his medium, you know, exacting the best ideas that he can come up with. And of course, uh, the lack of color uh, is determined by what technology gives us. And so you, you're not really in control of that uh, unless you're working in the way that Michael is working. Uh, so I, again, Michael, I give my hat to you on that. But as far as I'm concerned, good old fashioned, you know, traditional printmaking is where I'm gonna stay. Well, I want to end, uh, end the panel part of it with just one more question because I wanna leave some time for questions from the audience. And I wonder if anyone here, and you don't have to all talk if you don't want to, but if, I'd like all of you to, if you feel you have something to say, about your thoughts on the contemporary art scene in Washington, D.C., your ability to show in the galleries, the uh, great turnover we've had in galleries, the interest of the um, audience in Washington, D.C., anything relating to being an artist in this area and showing, selling, talking about your prints. I kind of feel things were at a real low when our street kind of went down. Uh, our street was happening. Uh, um, then when the, um, the automatic came, that was a spark. I mean, that was fun. That was exciting. You could play around and experiment. And I think something is going on now. I don't know exactly what it is. I mean, there are a lot of galleries and there are a lot of things that just seem to be a lot more opportunities for people to show. Because uh, back in the day, uh, I mean, black folks didn't show on February. But now black folks are showing throughout the whole year, you know. Uh, something is going on now, but I don't know exactly what it is. And you, you might be able to find that same thing all up and down the East Coast. Well, I'm having the time of my life uh, right now. I'm Working in my studio, I have a couple of uh, commissions. Uh, I'm associated with uh, Chris Addison and his and the Sylvia Ripley's gallery, uh, Addison Ripley Gallery. Uh, they say they love what I do and they show it and they're selling it. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, the gallery scene is very, very healthy from that point of view of Lou Stovall and Addison Ripley Gallery. 
I make a practice of not going to other gallery openings because I always run into someone who I have promised something to and, they <laughs> <laughs> and, and then they remind me of it, you see? <laughs> so, so I tend to, if I'm going to see another show, then I go to the galleries, you know, kind of on a very, very random basis and I show up, you know, kind of mid-morning with my assistant uh, and we look and see what's there and then we go back to my studio, you know. So I think that, uh, that life and the arts is going to be an ongoing thing forever. And I mean, even in the deepest, darkest period of, uh, of war that we've had, we have artists who are still working in their studios and they're not necessarily reflecting what's going on in their lives. Some of them are reflecting on what's going on in their heads. So we have the spirit of art that's within people who bring themselves to art or give themselves to art. So we're always going to have a wonderful gallery scene in Washington on one level or another. And as Michael said, uh, there was a time when February was the month for black artists. Well, one friend of mine said, I don't want to show anymore just in February. And I said, listen, you're an artist, take every opportunity. He said, oh, that's right. You know, take every opportunity to show your work. Yeah. Lynn? Um, okay. I, I, I think some of my answer would be obvious that um, you know, Washington's not New York and Washington's not Los Angeles, but um, it has benefits that you couldn't find in another large city. It, um, we have the museums, which are an amazing resource, um, and um, a smaller art community, but in that regard, people know one another, and there's um, a supportive environment. It's not um, cutthroat the way that a larger city could be. Um, and um, an opportunity to know the curators and the museums and whatnot. Um, I, you know, it's, I am doing well here and enjoy knowing my collectors and um, cur the curators um, and um, a lot of people that are supportive of the arts. I also think it's really important to the city because of the focus here being something else. Whereas in New York, the focus is um, oftentimes, all the different ways that people are being creative, and um, you know, our creativity here happens to be um, politics. <laughs> so I think that um, the visual arts are a really important part of um, the richness of Washington here. Yeah. Can I add something before sure. you? We have something in Washington called the Art Bank, which is run by the DC Commission of the Arts and Humanities. And the Art Bank regularly comes out and have done this for a number of years and goes to artist studios, buy their art, put them in the Art Bank. Eventually, those pieces of art ends up in government offices and so on. So instead of uh, artists in Washington fretting about not having uh, endowment support, uh, we do in fact have uh, the Art Bank purchasing artwork and putting it in offices where it can be seen. So that's, that's a plus that most cities do not have. There's also one other thing. I don't know if you guys have this experience, but um, that um, because it's not a more frenetic place to um, be exhibiting, there's um, more quiet to make your work and less distraction. So, um, you know, I've lived in Washington and I've lived in California and I find that making art here, um, that there, there's just um, a certain kind of focus that you can have here because it's more quiet um, with that, within that community of art making. Andrea, I'm going to let you have the last word in this part of the discussion um, and see if you'd like to add something. Well, I, I've been making art in Washington for over 30 years, and um, I've actually made a living um, from my art. And um, it's only been in the last half of my career, really, that I've shown my work in other places. And um, I, don't know, I don't know how I made a living. Uh, doing art and just selling it in Washington, but I did. And 
but frugality is part of uh, um, the art of survival. Um, but anyway, it's, it, you know, it's, it's been a great place to work. And I tend to be very hermetic when I'm in Washington. I have more of a social life in California, and I divide my time between the Bay Area and uh, Washington. And I always enjoy just being in my apartment and um, you know, just having all that solitude uh, in such a lovely place, it's, it's especially the spring and the fall. Uh, when I'm here. <laughs> okay, well good, thanks. Thanks a lot. And I'd like to now open up the discussion to the audience. If you have any questions, <clears throat> please go to one of the two microphones so that we can um, record what your question is. And, um, oh yeah, can we lift the house lights? Because it's, it's a little hard for us to see. Thanks. Out into the audience. Yeah, and can we turn this down too? Yeah. Can we turn that off? Might be distracting. Okay, do we have any questions? We have a question over here. Yeah, we have four wonderful artists up there. Three of them are traditional printmakers, and we have one that uses new technology. The three traditional printmakers are all seem to be abstract, non-objective forms. Michael is the only one up there with figurative, objective forms. Now, is there a trend there, or is there some reason why this different type of printmaking lends itself to these different uh, types of um, uh, expositions? Not really. Uh, I've always been a figurative person. I mean, I've, I've always drawn people. Uh, when I was in school, uh, we didn't have drawing assignments. It was this naked white woman up there, and you're supposed to, <laughs> supposed to draw, and you, or you're supposed to paint. And then, but you started to look around. And uh, you saw the third year students and seniors, they were doing what they wanted to do. So you just started to do what you wanted to do. And the school I went to was basically, they really pushed the figure. So when I got out of school, you, know, you just keep doing the figure. I just <coughs> like drawing people or saying what I want to say through people. Question over here? Yeah, I have a question for Lou. Um, I think a number of years ago, your career took a special turn when you started doing monoprints. I was wondering if you could enlighten the office, you know, the audience a little bit about what is a monoprint and sort of how you sort of evolved into this kind of this type of sort of combination printmaking. I guess it had mostly to do with the fact that I had been making prints uh, since I was 15. And I got to a point where I was about 60, and I was pretty much known as everyone's printmaker, uh, but not my own. And another reason is that uh, I finally got to a point where I wanted to invent, not just invent for other people, but invent for myself. Um, so the whole idea of making monoprints uh, there was so much joy, personal joy, that I had from doing that. And also the aspect of discovery, um, because I had been doing that right along, but discovering elements of printmaking that I would share with other artists. And one of the reasons that I became a printmaker anyway was because um, going through college and having my peers excited about what I was doing and having a fairly secure ego, wanting to be appreciated for what I could do. Uh, so making, you know, those prints for my friends and so on, and also charging them a few bucks for doing it, uh, helped my economy. Uh, and then realizing that uh, art is what, well, the reason that most people make art is to share it with someone, and why not share it in the best way possible in silkscreen printmaking with its bright color and accessibility of, you know, seemed to be the right way to go. We have another question over here? Yeah, um, thanks very much for showing us your work and talking about it, it was terrific. Um, my question is for Joanne, really. Um, okay. <laughs> Lynn and Andrea were kind enough to share with us um, the identification of their master printers and their print shops and to describe the collaborations. And I noticed that that information is not on the 
wall plaques in the show. Is it possible to share that with us? Well, you know, that was an issue that we always deal with whenever we show prints because the, as everyone has said, they collaborate and the collaborators are really important. But we do try to keep the text on our labels down to a minimum. And sometimes there are many people collaborating on a single print. So if we gave credit to all the people who were involved, we'd have these really long text labels. And so that's really just a housekeeping detail. Um, if you want to know who printed them, you're welcome to, I, you know, I don't even know if we have that on our um, website. And we do, by the way, have a website for this exhibition that um, just go to americanart.si.edu and that is the museum website and if you click on multiplicity slideshow you'll see everything in that um, exhibition including these artists work. And um, it's really just the length of the labels. I, so I can understand that. Perhaps you could post it on the, see that it was posted on the let's website. Let's see, yeah, let me look into that. That might be a good idea because one of the things um. we try to do on our website is add information that we don't have in the exhibition. So for example, there are two series in this exhibition that are too big to be shown in entirety. The Kara Walker series, we're showing four prints, but the entire series is 15 prints. And the Luc Dubois series is 43 prints, and we are only showing two of them, but the entire series are on our website. So that's a very good suggestion. There was once that we did, uh, we had a show, I think it must have been 15 years ago, and it was about collaborative printmaking. And because it was about collaborative printmaking, we named the workshops and we named all the printers with these huge long labels. And after that, we decided maybe we better not do that. But, you know, I'll look into that. Maybe we can do that on the print. Thanks. On the website. Great. Another question? I think she's maybe oh, you're waiting next. For okay. <laughs> Hello, good evening. My name is Jean Viev Nixon. I'm a graduate student at Howard University. Uh, my question is for all the panelists. Uh, you, you, I, I truly respect all your work and am inspired by it. And I wanted to know how do you personally keep pushing the envelope? Um, how do you continue to grow as an artist? I mean, individually, you all have kind of come into your own and made your own mark. But how do you keep pushing the envelope and growing past some of those uh, stagnant situations where you kind of have that uh, artistic block? Starting from <laughs> Mr. Platt. <laughs> well, artistic blocks, uh, I usually don't have too many of them. Uh, I mean, either. it's just, let's say if I was stuck on something, I would just put two things together that I wouldn't normally do. I have a, pre, a print in there. I have this grid of these women in the basement. And for some strange reason, I decided to put uh, the hog head in it. <laughs> from, I got from uh, uh, right here, her barbecue. I don't know why I did that. Well, when I put that hog head in there and I pushed the uh, blending modes, something happened. I said, oh, where you been? Where have you been? Uh, one thing I like to do is, uh, that I always do, it, it, with me and my work, the secret is, is the blending modes. I start at the top and I use every last one of them until I say, where you been? You know, uh, that's when it happens to me. So uh, discovering something new um, in every piece of work, you know, is it, kind of important. You know, I just, I like doing this stuff. I wouldn't want to do anything else, so I don't have too many blocks. Um, I never have any blocks. Sorry. <laughs> um, but I think that uh, conceptually, um, my work is about evolution and the fact that nothing stays the same. And because that's my mode of working, um, I tend to have um, more ideas than I have time to execute because the work is so labor intensive. Um, but I just find that one door opens to the next. And I think that happens with a creative drive if you don't get in the way of it. I think most creative block comes from some, something that you're creating to get in the way of the creativity flowing. Um, but that's just my personal experience. I can't 
you know, I don't have a secret of success particularly, except to try to remain open to, to possibility in the moment. Are you asking as an artist, as a creative person? Yes, as a creative person, yes. Um, I, you know, I think for me it's gotten easier as I've um, gotten older and, um, you know, learning more about my own process and sort of accepting those periods where um, I'm at a bit of a loss. Um, and understanding that sometimes it's due to having just completed a large project. Or, but um, I also had a um, mentor in graduate school who um, helped me um, understand it during one day <laughs> where um, I, was, I was really having a hard time sort of figuring out where I was going with my work. And we had had a critique and um, I was really, I was in this dark place with it. And he, he left the studio, and I could hear his footsteps going away. And I kind of slumped down in my chair and thought, oh my god, how am I ever going to do this? And then I heard these little footsteps coming back. And he leaned around the corner through the doorway, and he said, nothing's going to happen if you don't start working. <laughs> <laughs> and I hold that with me. And I, um, I guess I believe that um, if you just keep your hand in it, that you will eventually find your way through that. And as I've grown older, um, those periods of time seem more natural to me and um, are actually part of my process. Well, for me, it's the movement of color. Um, I'm often thinking, well, I haven't done this yet, or I haven't done that, or whatever. So I'm, my mind is so full of things that I haven't done and that I haven't discovered that I can't wait to get back to the next piece. So it's, it's really the joy and excitement of working with color and forms and so on. Uh, I love pencil drawing, but somehow um, pencil drawing almost always takes a back seat to uh, working with color. Now we're running a little late, and I see we have three people up here, and I don't want to cut <coughs> or two people up here. <coughs> and I want to cut anyone off. So I can make it very brief. Uh -huh. all right, but I, I, I was going like to was gonna make a question that would go to all the audience, I mean all the panelists, but I'll cut it down to just one, um, and, and, and that is Ms. Myers. Um, as a historian, I can't avoid the questions of antecedents and inspiration, and uh, knowing what, what I have seen of Saul Lewitt's work and what I've seen of your work, I'm wondering is he a particular inspiration or is that an accident? I was going to ask other people about inspirations for their work, but if we're running out of time, I'll just point to the one. You're, you're talking yes. About, yeah, okay. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't doing um, What's really important to me, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with his process, but um, um, and his, uh, it's his print that's on the invitation to the exhibition. Um, it, it, as I said before, the labor of making the work is, is such a big part of it for me, and it actually does relate to that little story I told about my mentor in grad school, um, that I, you know, having my hand in it and kind of pushing myself to the limit with what I have to give, both physically and mentally. Um, and with LeWitt, it, it seems that, um, you know, his, he took his ideas and passed them on in a way that I don't do. Um, that, um, you know, for those of you that aren't familiar with his work, he also did large wall drawings, but he um, made instructions so that the drawings could be made by other people, some of whom he trained, as I understand it. Um, and I can't get much help doing my drawings, even when they're 70 feet long, except for sort of laying out the initial structure. Um, so I, I do think of LeWitt as one of my more important artistic ancestors. Um, and I've learned a lot from what he's done. Do we have one more question? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for letting me um, just ask this question really quickly. I've noticed throughout all of your different pieces and styles that use a lot of repeating forms or figures. Um, I know with Platt, he uses a lot of human figure. Um, Mr. Stovall, I see a lot of circular um, movement in your pieces. Ms. Myers, I see a lot of lines. And then Miss um, Way, I see um, you using a lot of your 
naturist features and bringing in the cicada wings and your shark teeth. I want to know if you guys um, kind of have always been drawing on this idea of multiplicity throughout your careers and now you're just kind of, wow, that really makes sense or um, do you guys kind of see everything you do as more kind of a solid piece of work that you try to put together? Well, most of my work um, up until recently was just one figure in the landscape. The idea of repeating something is, is something that's kind of new. I mean, the repeated image. Because uh, it just take too long to draw. <laughs> you, know, but, you know, if you can do it digitally, you know, you think the crowd's got to be different people. No, they don't. <laughs> It'll be the same person, same shoot. And just repeat it, you know. Uh, I like that idea of repeating something. Uh, it, it, it's it makes me think more about ritual. And if you can repeat the same the same person and make it feel like different people, you got the magic going. Anyone else care to address it? Um, well, I think theme and variation has always been um, what my work um, is dealing with, and it's all pattern and system um, d driven work. So um, that repetitive aspect is um, basically relating to the way things in life are made. <clears throat> Excuse my cold, but um, so it's been something I've been doing a long time. I think um, for me, it's um, I when I was a painter around the time when I finished my bachelor's degree, um, I was making images that were um, related to events, sort of um, maybe events of um, weather, other things like that, um, maybe even narrative <laughs> events. And um, over time, I became interested in the mark as the event in and of itself. And so the work that I've been doing over the past 10 or 15 years follows that idea. Um, and the line becomes, you know, each line sort of is an event of, um, in and of itself, but it's also multiple events, the, you know, every moment that I'm engaged with each particular line. So um, I think for me that, that there's a, a tempo that we all exist within and that's full of repetition. And so um, the work that I make uh, probably just relates to that very directly. Well, for me, it's very simple. I always go to nature for my own personal work. And there's always something happening out there. Uh, there's <coughs> the breeze blowing the leaves. Uh, there's uh, the shadow of one thing against another, uh, the statement of trees in a grove, you know, that kind of thing. So there's uh, constantly something that reminds me that I need to comment on that so that whatever I see, I can put it down and have it for someone else to see. And that's, again, what art is all about anyway. It's sharing. Well, thank you very much. Thank you to the artists. Thank you to the audience for coming.